Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first, I think this is the, no, this isn't the first episode in uh, September, but you know what, here we are, September, first full week, uh, holiday week for many people, uh, if you were in the U.S., many people had Monday off, I had took Monday off actually as well, and despite that fact, uh, it, it feels like we're on day 12 of the work week, but here we are. It is Friday, which means it's once a, ten, once a 10. Once again, time to be diving into the podcast and all good things that come from it. And despite the fact that it was a shorter week, there's still a lot going on in the world of Microsoft. Uh, kicking it off with things that were going on, not so much related, but it is on this thing. Uh, the Xbox One S is Destiny 2. It is out now. I've been playing the hell out of it. It's a fun game. If you like the first Destiny, you will very much like the second one. There's an actual story, and they've uh, just they've they've taken all the crap that was wrong with the first one, and then they've made it better for the second one, and there's a lot less grinding, at least it feels like, and so um, it's a good game. If you're on the fence, I recommend buying it. Just know that it's very much like the first one, but better, and it's still sort of a first-person shooter RPG type game, and uh, I am, I, I'm quite enjoying it. I actually played a little bit before the podcast, and so... Uh, yeah, let's just dive in, shall we? Because there's there's a lot to talk about. So one thing I learned this week that Mike, or Microsoft, Google is actually doing to Microsoft Azure partners. So if you know if you know me, I love the Azure and enterprise side of the stuff as well, and I find this kind of fascinating. So Google has their cloud, and Microsoft obviously obviously has Azure, and it is significantly larger than Google Cloud. And then there's also AWS. One thing Google is doing is going to my to Azure users and Azure resellers and sending them this nice little package that says, hey, if you chat with us, we'll give you a free Chromebook. And that's exactly what it is. And so it's just kind of an interesting sales tactic, a very expensive one at that, but at the same time, when these contracts cost millions of dollars, um, spending 200 bucks, which is probably less than that to get a sales lead, is not all that expensive. And so it's just kind of an interesting tactic to see what is going on and just how these companies are approaching that stuff. And so if you're an Azure partner, you've probably been receiving this stuff. It's been going on for a little bit, but it seems like Google sent out another wave of these things uh, in the past couple weeks just because I got a bunch of tips and actually somebody sent me some pictures of it. It's nothing too crazy. It's just a white box. It says Google Cloud on it or whatever. You open it up and there's some marketing material and says, hey, punch in this number and we'll send you a free Chromebook. Then conduct a call over Google Hangouts. But uh, just a little insight into how those things are going on. Uh, something that came out yesterday evening is that Microsoft's movie and TV no longer supports Disney movies anywhere. Now, I believe if you are to purchase content for the Disney movie anywhere prior to this announcement, it will continue to work anywhere as expected. But it is, it is a going forward thing that is being impacted here. And the reason why I believe this is happening is that Disney's launching their own streaming service in the near future. And they don't want you to be on a competitor. They want you to pay for Disney stuff. And so while this does suck for Microsoft uh, users of my movies and TV, I suspect, and actually I think it's already impacting Netflix, it's going to impact other services. So Yes, this sucks, uh, but this is the way it works, and Disney thinks they've got enough clout that they can launch their own streaming service, which I, I probably agree with, uh, although we tend to buy everything from Disney just because my daughter will watch it 75 times, which means that a $20 movie purchase gets its value out pretty quickly. So uh, I wouldn't be freaking out about that as if movies and TVs are going away on, on Microsoft stuff, but at the same time, that's just... You know, it's one less thing that makes it kind of suck, right? And so here we are. Uh, if you've been looking for insider previews, no previews until at Tuesday at the earliest, according to Donna. And yeah, and so whatever. They're just kind of ratcheting down. There's Don't expect anything new or fun. Those are all just bug fixes, unless you are on the skip ahead branch, which I was about to point to that machine because it is. But we didn't really get much there either. Um, so anyways, other things that I've been kind of poking around about, whatever the hell happened to Home Hub? Remember, there was like a lot of, um, I don't know, somebody wrote it up, I don't even know who it was, saying, hey, this is the next great thing, Microsoft is turning every computer into a Home Hub, and it's not in Redstone 3. Uh, I asked Raf to poke around in Redstone 4 to see if he saw anything. He's like, no, there's not a whole lot here either. So I don't really know what the future of Home Hub is. If anybody has any insight into that, uh, I'd be very curious. But as of right now, maybe it's just a feature that they're not going to continue to build out. But, I, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Somebody asked me, like, where'd that go? And clearly it's not coming in Redstone 3. And I don't know if they're abandoning the idea because it doesn't really make much sense because people aren't really slapping computers into their living room or their kitchens or wherever they expect this thing to be anymore. 
Now, granted, that's kind of been taken over by Amazon and like these ambient computing type devices and Invoke and uh, Invoke would be the perfect device for that, yet we don't have it. And uh, I got to figure out how I'm going to get my hands on one of those. And so um, Home Hub, I, I don't know where it went, but I'm guessing it's maybe gone at least for a little bit. And so, uh, speaking of Windows 10, by the way, so if you've been following the show for any amount of time, you've known that I've been stuck on anniversary update, and I kept searching and searching and searching, and it would never actually show it. And so I got a tip from, I believe it was Adam Corbelly, uh, or I believe it was him who, who suggested this. What you can do, and this worked the first time, is if you go into Settings, and then go into Windows Update, and go to Advanced Settings, there is a Defer Windows Update block, or like setting. And uh, all you do is you check it, which it doesn't make any sense. If you if you check it, it sounds like, hey, I'm going to defer these updates. But if you check it, then go back and hit search for updates, you will get 1703 instantly. It worked for myself. Uh, it worked for many other people. And I have absolutely no idea why this is working, which means this is the most Microsoft thing ever in that it is completely opposite of what you would expect. And then it worked perfectly. Um, so there you go. I don't, I don't know why that works, but it definitely works. So, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm not really sure why my machine wasn't getting it. I have a couple guesses. I don't know. So when I installed it, um, all my audio settings got reset. Everything stopped working. I had to reinstall drivers and do a few things. Uh, the other thing that was very odd is that I have... On this machine, you can't, I'm like pointing at it as if you could see it, especially if you're on the audio, you're definitely not seeing anything. I have uh, two 4K monitors and a 1080p monitor hooked up. And the 1080p monitor is actually connected to the Intel integrated graphics, the four, two 4Ks, and actually this one back here, so th technically three 4Ks are hooked up to my 980 Ti. The, the one that was connected to the Intel integrated graphics was giving me like green sparkles on the display and I was really nervous. I was like, okay, uh, is this the sign of my motherboard going bad or the integrated graphics crapping out? Um, so I ran a driver update and um, nothing. Like it did install a new driver, but that it didn't fix the problem. And then uh, I restarted, maybe that maybe kicked off the driver issue. And now the green sparkles are gone, and everything's back to working as expected. And so if I could insert a GIF into this show, it would be now what? Like, there wasn't really much in the creator's update, but um, I guess I feel better now that I'm here, and I'm eagerly awaiting the fall creator's update, which does have a lot of visual elements that will um, appease my small, simple little brain, because that's what we all like. Uh, other good things happening in the world of Windows 10 for Microsoft uh, Edge, which is obviously their browser, is getting Grammarly. And this may not sound like a lot of whatever, but Grammarly is a very important plugin, at least in my workflow. And I actually highly recommend it for anybody. It's it's free. I actually don't recommend paying for the premium version because it doesn't give you a whole lot of advanced functionality that's worth it, at least for me. And it's basically a better spell check for everything. And so I've actually noticed a significant reduced number of reports on crap that I've written, having errors. And so Grammarly is now on Edge, and uh, you can install that. It's an extension. It's free. I, I actually highly recommend it. Um, once you kind of get used to it, you will never go back. Other things that came out this week, and I suspect I know why they did this. Uh, Microsoft says that ARM-based PCs from Qualcomm are on track for a, a uh, holiday release here, Q4. And so there were some rumors flying around that this stuff had been delayed. And so I'm not going to call anybody out because I don't know if it was ever made public or what. It was kind of whispers behind the scenes. It was, uh, I don't know if this is actually happening. And so Microsoft and Qualcomm have both definitively come out and said, hey, these things are going to be shipping Q4 of this year. And so be on the lookout for that. I'm hoping we're going to hear more about that. You would think that Microsoft is going to have to like come out and really start talking about this. And so that kind of leads me to this next thing. So Microsoft revealed this week that they're going to have a Surface event in London. Now, granted, this is inside of what it's called Decoded. And Microsoft has been doing this stuff for a while, I believe. I'm not fully familiar with Decoded because it's in London and I am not. Uh, but they told, it was, uh, I believe, Tom, that, hey, we're going to have this thing and Panos is going to be there and there's going to be some hardware stuff. And this just felt really weird. So I've been following Microsoft for over a decade now. And I can't recall a time that they were going to announce hardware at an, in a way such as this. Now, going back actually to earlier this year, they did launch new Surface hardware in China, uh, the Surface Pro, but that was by all accounts a minor revision. And here's the other thing. They told us about that event two weeks before it happened. I think it was 10 to 14 days uh, before that event happened. 
And so now here is Microsoft coming out uh, six, seven weeks before this decoded event saying, hey, we're going to have a Surface event um, or Surface announcement at this decoded event in late October. And this makes no sense. This is very abnormal for Microsoft. I honestly think that they screwed up here and that this was not supposed to be announced. Now, the, the next question becomes is, are they going to have a New York event? Typically, New York is where they talk about new hardware and all that kind of stuff. And when, based on a, a, limited, a limited history here, we know that when they do things internationally, uh, it's just a minor revision. And I don't expect them to do a major overhaul of the Surface Book. I really don't. It doesn't make sense. It, it's a brand new design. Well, brand new. I mean, it's two years, but um, they're very much following the Apple model. I suspect that they're just going to do a spec bump. Um, I know I've said this a million times. It wouldn't surprise me if they get rid of the non-DGPU model and only stick with a dual GPU and make it almost like a Surface Book Pro. Uh, I don't think they're going to name it like Surface Laptop Pro or anything like that. I think that'd be crazy. But... Um, I, I, if they only have the London event, then it's going to be a small thing. Now, what they could do, and I haven't heard either way, is that uh, they could have a New York event, and then they could do another thing in London for saying, hey, here's the international availability and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk more about it at London after they hold a New York event. And it wouldn't surprise me. The, the biggest thing that I'm struggling with here is why is this information out so very early? People are saying, oh, it's because Apple has all their stuff. Now, I don't think that's it. Like, this is... Microsoft doesn't do this. Like they're not going to try to submarine uh, Apple's event next week or Google or Samsung's like, that's just not really them. And again, this is so far out that it makes zero sense because as soon as you start saying that there's going to be an event, sales of old hardware are going to slow down significantly. And here we are. It, it, it Something is off about this. And I'm trying to figure it out. Microsoft isn't talking. I, I ping them about this. They're like, ah, no, we have nothing to say right now. Uh, which leads me to believe that this was not intentional by any account. So, but anyways, there's going to be something in Surface in October. Although I think I've said that a few times now. I've been, I knew that there was going to be something in October. I don't quite have all the details yet. If I did, trust me, I would be sharing them as soon as I was able to confirm them. But um, yeah, I... I expect a spec bump. I kind of hope that they do a spec bump on this machine back here to go to a solid state architecture. And honestly, I hope that they figure out how to reduce the fan noise because that's my biggest complaint about this machine back here right now is the fan noise. If they can fix that, that'll be uh, it'll be a good upgrade. It really honestly will be, despite the fact that it may not sound like it. Uh, other things happening in the world of Microsoft, they recently, as in uh, very recently, got a patent for a uh, fingerprint reader that lives underneath the display. This is very interesting. I know other companies have been trying to do this. Microsoft got a patent for a fingerprint sensor under the display, and obviously there's a lot of use cases for this. Clearly some sort of mobile device could benefit from this. I even think like Surface devices, especially the Surface Pro, could benefit from something like this, although it's a little bit awkward to do that maybe on the display and not on the keyboard. But it's still, uh, there's a lot of use cases for that. And so we will see if Microsoft actually makes use of that or if they just wanted to grab the uh, the patent. And the other things that, again, I think this leaked out, if I'm completely honest here. I, I think one leaked is the wrong word. I think Microsoft screwed up again. Uh, that would be two times this week if my thoughts and uh conjecture are accurate. So Microsoft this week, there's some people who were logging into Office 365 said, hey, Skype for Business is going to be, is turning into Microsoft Teams. And this just showed up briefly and then went away very quickly, which is why I think somebody screwed up. And uh, then Microsoft hastily put out a uh, message in the admin portal because this this blew up. Um, I wrote this up on Petri and is by far our biggest hitting post of the day. Um, very likely the month, if not the quarter, potentially even the year. I don't, well, year might be. We have some bigger ones earlier in the spring, but it is doing. It, it went blew up very quickly. I was almost going to say viral, but that's probably not accurate. Uh, and anyway, so what the like? What is going on? Skype for Business used to be called Link, and then I think before that maybe Office Communicator. Uh, but anyways, so they're looking at rebranding Skype for Business under the Teams umbrella, which kind of threw things into a crazy thing because people, not everybody likes Teams. It's a different type of application and Skype for Business does a lot more 
than just what Teams does. It does PBX type style things. And so like the business world was like, oh shit. Uh, and so Microsoft put out a hastily written thing in their admin portal saying, hey, this is, they're trying this. They're, they're upgrading people from Skype for business to Teams. And so there's a lot of things uh, still unknown. Like how are they going to fully integrate the chat types of things? And, uh, how are they, you know, it, it's, they're, they're not too far different Skype for business and teams. And I can see how this can work, but at the same time, they're different enough that they've got a long way to go to fully make them interoperable. Uh, I emailed Microsoft about this to try to get a comment and they said, Hey, we have no actual comment other than things that we've pushed publicly. And that's why I kind of think this was a premature announcement. I fully expect if Microsoft is going to talk about this, they're going to be doing it at ignite, which will take place from the, uh, what is it? 24 fourth through the 29th something like that uh, i know i've said it before i will be there definitely let me know if you're going to be there too and i think this is a, a very much an ignite related announcement that kind of showed up a bit early and so um yeah be looking out for that i don't know what else they're going to do but i suspect that they will tell us more of the narrative as we typically call it about what is actually happening to skype for business so uh, Jonathan Riley writes in the chat section, he says, hey, I actually love Skype or Skype for business. I actually love Teams. He says we use it every day at work. And aside from little glitches here and there, uh, I'm assuming that he's meaning that it is pretty good. And so I've actually heard a lot of positive things about Teams. I, I'm not trying to talk down upon Teams, but I also know that not everybody is using it. It's a relatively new product in the world of producti productivity. We're getting close to about a year old. I think it was announced in October of last year. Uh, that sounds about right. And so, yeah. There we go. Uh, Teams is morphing, or Skype for Business is morphing into Teams, something along like that. There's going to be more to that story here in the very near future. So uh, other things too, as somebody asked, uh, I've been going back and forth whether or not I was going to go PC gaming or Xbox One X. I think at this point, I'm I'm going to stick keep my Xbox One X pre-order. I don't think I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, PC gaming, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's a you get a superior experience from graphics, but you know what? Destiny's out now. I've already dumped probably 15 hours into that game. I'm not going to redo it on the PC. Player Unknown Battleground, which is coming to that thing, will be out later this year. And I think Destiny's going to keep me occupied for quite a while until that game comes out. And so I don't think I'm going to jump back into PC gaming because, uh, yeah, I think the Xbox One X is going to be a winner for me at the end of the day. Even though I've kind of been like on the fence about whether or not you should do it. Um, 500 bucks is a lot of money. Absolutely is. But for as much as time as I play on the thing, I think it's, uh, certainly worth it. So let's dive into the questions this week. It's been a little bit shorter of a week. Monday was a downer because the, well, not a downer it was a day off for most people and, uh, kind of gave us less fodder for the week. And as we kind of lead up to ignite here, it's going to be all eyes on what's going to be happening at that event. Uh, also Apple's event next week. And which is why I don't think Microsoft is going to do anything crazy because Apple is going to dominate the press cycle for the next uh, couple days next week. And so why put anything out that's going to get lost in that? Uh, anyways, so MJ Yoka asks, he says, with rumors of a Surface hardware refresh event on the horizon, do you think it's possible Microsoft would release a version of the stu Surface Studio that functions as a true monitor without the computer guts? I hope. Like, I don't have any information on this. Everybody in their world wants a Surface Studio monitor, not the actual desktop components. I am one of those people. I worry significantly about the price. It's probably a... When it launched, Microsoft told me kind of behind the doors that it was about 2000 bucks for that monitor, just the monitor. I mean, you got to remember, it's basically a laptop on the bottom and connected to a very expensive monitor. And so I hope they come out with a... A, it doesn't even need to be touchscreen, although that would kind of go against Microsoft's mantra right now. I would love for just a that monitor, non-swivel. It doesn't even need to be touchscreen glossy. I would probably end up buying two of them. I would probably have to mortgage my house to afford that. But I I hope. I, I just worry that if they do, the, the pricing is going to be very prohibitive. But you know what? Maybe if they do a whole bunch of monitors, that'll help bring cost of uh, goods sold down by way of economies of scale. And there you go. So I don't know. I hope that they do because there's not a proper three by two monitor on the market. I, I can't think of one that's the same aspect ratio as that display. Everything is 16 by nine. I'm using two 16 by nines. Would I get two three by two monitors? Hell yeah, I would. I love that resolution or that aspect ratio, I should say. So we will see. Uh, Usman asks, he says, 
Are you able to question the Skype team if they're looking to bring any MS Teams functionality to the regular client? Oh, going backwards a little bit. There's instances where we use consumer Skype for work. Actually, we use uh, Paul and I and the whole Blue Well Web Media Group, which uh, owns Throughout and Petri, uses Skype consumer as our uh, work and planning stuff. And he's curious if they're actually going to bring some of those features to the Skype consumer client. I don't know. Um, right now they're working on this big design overhaul to kind of bring this parody and they are introducing new features. My gut kind of tells me that it won't. The only reason I say that, at least not yet, the only reason I say that is because the features that they've been including are very much designed at user growth rather than user retention. And so uh, when I say user growth, I mean they're top, they put like a fake stories thing in. They're looking, they're trying to grab new users because they've been stagnant at about 300 million users for like five, six years at this point. And so they're looking for things to grab new users. I don't know if that's going to do it. If Microsoft is trying to go for the productivity aspect of it, they're definitely going to want, uh, they're definitely going to want people to pay up and go to Teams for it. That would be my thing. So that's kind of that. Uh, da, 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 da. The Zeni asks, he says, Microsoft has had some really high profile hirings for Azure in the last few weeks. Good paying attention. They very much have. Uh, who've gotten a lot of attention in the dev community. Do you think this post Windows Microsoft is moving its focus on Azure or just good hirings but not related to strategy shift? Here's what I honestly think. Um, Azure is doing exceptionally well for Microsoft. It is a very bright spot inside the company. It gets, uh, if you want to be recognized by upper management, it's like go play in Azure and create some stuff. Like that's where all the, I shouldn't say all the energy, but a lot of the energy is focused because they're getting 90 to 110% uh, growth year or quarter over quarter. Like it's, or is it year over year? But they're, Azure is growing like crazy. And so what they're doing there with the open source stuff, um, being much more transparent and saying, hey, you know what? We support every platform. It's these high profile developers who generally uh, resided more in the open source community in the Linux world just because of the more transparency and they had more flexibility are now coming back to Azure because of that. And so Microsoft is landing a lot of good hires in that area. I've seen it. Uh, I think it's Jeff Sanquist, I believe, is leading that group or some of it. It's their developer advocates. They've hired some women. They've hired some men. They've hired a whole bunch of people. And they're really pushing this stuff, much like Google is with their cloud, like we talked about earlier in the show. But Microsoft has the benefit of already having market, uh, a, a very large market presence, and they're dumping billions into these data centers. They announced, what, two more for ad, or for Australia. They've got a couple in Germany that they opened this year. And so it, it's kind of a hot commodity, or not hot commodity, a hot place to be. And it's a good thing to have on your resume by all means is saying, hey, I helped work on Azure, uh, considering how well it's doing. So I think it's a little bit of strategy shift. Um, Nadella's background is all Azure. And so I think they know that they have upper management support with Azure. They have good profitability and they are showing a lot of growth. I mean, who doesn't want to go work for some place that has high growth, high revenues or high margins and high management visibility? Who who doesn't want that? And so I think that's one of the reasons why Azure is doing so well and they're getting all these top named people. Uh, Martininus V2, he says, he asks a couple questions here. He says, do you think that Microsoft should let UWP go and return to the old start, start menu that so many love? No, I don't. Um, despite the failures and shortcomings and slow adoption of UWP, it is still a brighter future than Win32. Are we ever going to get rid of Win32? Probably eventually, but we're talking decades here at this point. And so I don't think that they should get rid of it. They need to keep trying to entice more people to come into it. And we've seen a good uptick, right? Spotify's in there. Uh, Newton Mail. Granted, they're not all true UWPs, and I probably should qualify that saying the store model should not go away. Uh, they need to just make sure you retain that security and all that. And then he says, or should Microsoft at least replace UWP with real Xamarin Windows and have real multi-platform framework on Windows, iOS, and Android, kind of like Embarcado did with Delphi and Fire with their Fire Monkey framework. That is a very good idea, I personally think. Um, the problem is they're going to be competing against progressive web apps at this point. And progressive web apps are coming down. Uh, they're not going to be here tomorrow or you know overnight, but they're definitely growing in popularity and they're definitely growing in um, 
where you're seeing them pop up. And so it's, should they go down that route? I don't think it's a bad thing, but they're also competing with progressive web apps. I think if Microsoft's going to go all in on something, it should be progressive web apps because they have the most to gain from that. Uh, and then he also says, I see that Microsoft is updating Windows apps more frequently lately, but is Microsoft really serious about giving us first class uh, from the store? So Microsoft, here's my problem with Microsoft, and one of the reasons why I've moved away is that they're updating their mail, actually mail and calendar, too slow. Uh, after using third-party apps and seeing how good uh, you know mail apps can be, after sticking with mail and calendar for two years, the evolution was too slow. And I'm kind of on this kick now where I'm going to start trying to buy apps from companies that only do one thing because you know you're going to get a lot of updates relatively quickly. So... Um, they are updating their apps, but again, they're not revenue drivers, so they're not a pure priority for Microsoft because if they ship, let's just say 15 updates to mail and they get more users, they're not going to make more money out of it. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, and then he says, geez, four questions here. No problem though. All good. Uh, I know that Google is having antitrust issues in the UE. Do you think the Opera and the, uh, I can never, Vivaldi, Vivaldi browser expressing the concern about Google finally trying to show us that Google is doing the same things Microsoft did in the past. So Google's in a really interesting position where they have a lot of market control with search. And that becomes a big responsibility because if, imagine if Microsoft just said, you know what? we can't really compete with Google and search. And so we're just going to kind of wind down operations. Google would be in a lot of trouble because then they would own, uh, they would be considered a monopoly. Ugh. Google needs Bing probably more than Bing. Microsoft needs Bing potentially. Uh, it's, it's an interesting little scenario here. And so Google has to be very careful because if they are found to be promoting their own products more favorably in search, which doesn't sound like a crazy idea, uh, that's in the EU at least that's considered antitrust and so that's going to be a problem with the Chrome browser and I don't really have a definitive opinion on this yet I need to see more of how this is playing out and what the evidence is that Google is promoting their own products specifically Chrome uh, I don't know Google could find themselves in a very rough situation because the EU is not very doesn't hold back a lot on these things they're getting fined all over the place and clearly the browser ballot screen, as much as we make fun of it with Internet Explorer, actually worked because now Internet Explorer and Edge are, I don't want to say irrelevant, but they're a very small fraction of what they used to be. And so now Chrome uh, is taking over. But I don't know if Chrome is the anti-competitive product. I think it's Google Search is where they're going to come under more fire. So Avarota asks, he says, Brad, it seems like the rumored project Andromeda and Seashell seem to have been getting random by Paul and touted as another mobile reboot. I think that Windows, I think full Windows 10 mobile devices would actually be a hit in the market. Google seems to have a similar idea by creating Google uh, with their Fuchsia for future devices. Do you think the existence of Google Fuchsia validates what Microsoft's approach to Andromeda Seashell? And yeah, um, so here's... He, he, you got to be very careful here. Microsoft lost over $10 billion in the mobile segment. They're very hesitant about going back into that space. When they release a mobile device, whatever this Andromeda thing is, it needs to be fundamentally different than this thing, um, than just a phone or even, where's my iPhone? It, it, it can't be just another one of these. It can't just be a, a slab of display and all that like that's not going to work it's not going to sell in any any sort of volume you got to remember when microsoft releases a product to be competitive it needs to sell 500 million right ios has a billion users android has, has i want to say it's 2 billion users so if they release a product and it sells 10 million uh, that's not going to do them any good with developers it's not going to get them any market share they need a product that's going to sell in such a high volume that it has to be def fundamentally different. And so I'm waiting to learn more about this Andromeda thing. I think it's more than one display potentially, but it has to be something relatively significant if Microsoft wants to have any sort of chance. And so the reason why people get real, like Paul and Mary Jo and people saying, eh, if they release another smartphone, it's not going to do anything. And I, I tend to agree with that is, and people are going to say I'm being negative, but you got to remember if they release a full Windows 10 on a phone, 
that's not going to sell 500 million units. Now, granted, that could take a couple years, but it's not going to sell 25 million units the first year. It's just not, guys. And I hate to say that. It needs to be something like ARM base, have always on connectivity. Uh, it needs to be full Windows 10. It needs to have continuum support. And it needs to be so much different and better than what's on the market that people will buy it and pay a premium for it. Because you got to remember, to get that top end hardware, it's going to be expensive. We're looking at iPhones, they're going to cost a thousand bucks. Samsung Galaxy Note 8, which is right in the same arena as where I think this Andromeda will play, is a, a, roughly a thousand dollars. And so. You got to remember, whatever Microsoft releases has to be profitable because they're very hesitant as they've already lost $10 billion trying to build phones. So that's that's why Microsoft, you hear internally that they're very, not scared, but they're, they're approaching this very cautiously and waiting till they think they have something which may or may not arrive in the near future. Um, would a super small form factor full 10 win PC in your pocket be a good device? Yes, but it needs to come with the full suite of being able to connect to a PC uh, with a good desktop experience, have enough power and enough battery life that it's actually a Win PC without compromise. If it has two hour battery life when connected to a larger display, that's not, th th there's a lot of compromise there. And so uh, I'm waiting to learn more and to see how Microsoft is going to approach this and what they're going to try to do. But whatever they do, it's got to be it's got to be good. The mediocre or on par doesn't work anymore because iOS and Android have such a massive lead that is such a hard thing to overcome for them. So uh, they're not out of it, though. I, I shouldn't say they're not out of it. It's not like they're not trying. They're definitely working on something. Alex Kipman's working on the display technology. Um, and so I'll be curious to see what they're going to try to do. Poncelius, he says, if Microsoft becomes the cloud company, at what point does it matter what people use, whether people use Windows Client? Maybe it won't matter. I agree. If everyone has a Chromebook and to access Microsoft services, it, this has become very apparent. Microsoft is trying to move to a world where Windows is obviously preferred, but not the only solution. Look at, they've already got SQL Server on Linux. They've already got other applications on uh, running in the browser. You don't need Windows, right? You can run Office 365. Uh, you can run those Office web apps, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all in a browser. So they're preparing for a world where Windows doesn't need to be the underlying architecture. And this is where those progressive web apps come into play. And so Windows is, you can imagine if Microsoft released no more builds of Windows, if 1703 was it, would anything really change in Windows 10? Uh, it's not like Microsoft is growing the user base of Windows as a whole, not Windows 10, but Windows as a whole. When you combine seven, let's just say seven and 10, it's not like next week they're going to have the ability to add 100 million new users to the Windows world. It's not going to happen. It, the Windows is like saturated. Um, I think they always say like 1 billion or 1.5 billion users, which is massive. But at the same time, there's there's not a lot of room for growth there. And so uh, I do think they're going to become a cloud company. I actually wrote this week that I think I talked about it last podcast that it is thin client. Like they need to come to a world where you just turn on Windows is just a thing that connects to an Azure desktop and it runs that way. I think we're headed that way. It's going to take some time to get there. But in a place that has high connectivity, uh, which is a lot of the world. Now, it's not all of it, and it's not perfect. People were saying, you know what? I don't have great connectivity. I know that. But a lot of enterprises do. A lot of enterprises have very high connectivity. A lot of homeowners around the world do. Not everybody, again. And so a thin type client where you can just log into a, a cloud-based desktop when you, when you need it, for that matter, is certainly a viable option. Uh, Usman asks us, why is it Invoke taking a whole year to hit store shelves? Because it's an embarrassment. I, 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 that's probably too strong, but it's ridiculous. Do you think they revealed it prematurely as a knee-jerk reaction to Google Home and Echo? This very well could be. This seems to be the theme of the show uh, of premature announcements. But yeah, I actually think it was is that there's all that momentum. Microsoft would be like, hey, we're coming too. And I don't know if they didn't expect it to be until fall or what. I don't know why they announced it. It's going to be about a... Just like. Well, it's been 10 months since it was been announced, roughly. And so that's a long time for people to wait. And if it, it better be good. And then they announced this uh, Amazon, and I don't want to say the word because I've got a, one of the Echoes right over there. Um, you've got the Amazon and Microsoft integration for the personal smart assistants. I don't know. We'll be curious to see when this thing actually comes to market. It might be in October uh, would be my guess, but that's, we'll see. And then Adam Jarvis 
or maybe it was Adam Jarvis who mentioned the update thing, not Adam Corbelly. There's, I recognize some of these names, and I can never remember who it was. I think it might have been Adam Jarvis. But anyways, whoever it was, the Adam that recommended how to get Windows 10 updates. Uh, there you go. Anyways, Adam Jarvis asks, he says, Windows 10 1607 update is arguably the most stable version of Windows 10 to date. Uh, Q, question one is, Windows 10 anniversary update, the time to jump off moving conveyor belted is Windows 10 as a service if you could. Uh, so here's the thing. So you can stay on 1607 as long as you want until they stop supporting it. So what, you've probably got ballpark another year, maybe max, uh, before that gets deprecated because they're going to come out with, they said 18, 18 months. So yeah, uh, you can stay on it as long as you want, but then it's going to eventually stop. I mean, if you truly want just pure stability, if you can figure out how to get on the long-term servicing branch, that's your best bet. But uh, 1607 is the best version right now. 1703 will become that once 1709 is out, which is October 17th, I think, uh, or something like that. But um, yeah, so I would I jump off the Windows as a service? The problem is you really can't. You're always going to be in this perpetual limbo unless you jump onto the long-term servicing branch, which if you're a consumer, you can't really do. So you, I would just stick with the oldest available, or to be honest, whatever's working on your machine well. Um, 1703 appears to be working okay. And, you know, that is that. So Adam Jarvis asks, his second question is, he says, how would, how would you, what is the counter argument that Windows 10 as a service is now at a point of fragmenting? Um, so is Windows 10 fragmented? I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't think fragmentation is the right word. The, the reason why I don't want to say fragmentation isn't the right word, because for the vast majority of the users of Windows 10, there is a couple examples of some Intel chips. Was it, uh, one of the trail Atom chips can't upgrade, but fragmentation to me means that you can't move to the next version of the operating system. Like some versions of some Android phones were never offered updates. So they're stuck. Windows 10 users vast majority of them are not stuck. So I don't think fragmentation is the right word at this time because anybody can upgrade. It's just whether or not they want to upgrade. And so I don't think fragmentation is the correct word for that. And so I think Microsoft has done a good job of being able to let everyone upgrade when they want, um, provided they know how. And if they don't, then it will eventually just get shoved down their throat uh, once it's proven to be stable. So there you go. Uh, somebody asked what this is. So this... These, what headsets? Uh, this is this is an old one. So this is what I, I game with. So you can, can see my broken Elite controller there. I've glued it back many times trying to save that little rubbery patch. Uh, these are the Turtle Beach X07s. And to be honest, they're fine. I hate this little thing though. This chat pad is like the most insane way to try to adjust volume. I, I still want, and I have yet to receive in Xbox, I want two sliders. I want a game volume slider, and I want a voice chat slider. Like, that's all I want. Because these buttons are like some cryptic way that you adjust the volume, and then you're supposed to hit, like, the people button if you want the people to be louder. But it never works as you would hope. And so then you hit the gaming button, and then you just get lost. Uh, it's terrible. I hate that little thing. It is by far the worst experience on the Xbox at this time. And so, anyway, Turtle Beach X07. I don't know if you can still buy these things. I'm going to be getting a new pair of the truly wireless ones that are coming out later this year. Uh, because these things are falling apart. Uh, you can kind of, I don't know if you can see that there, but like the padding. I mean, they've, I've had them since, uh, I think, the original Xbox One came out. So, around that time. So, they're a couple years old. They've, I've got my money's worth out of them. And so, I'm going to get some of the truly wireless ones. I don't know which version yet. So... Uh, that is that, guys. So this has been, wow, this went a little bit longer than expected. Um, but that's always a good thing. And so, as always, guys, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, I'll be curious to see what happens next week if Microsoft is going to have another large, any, I don't know, any announcements. There should hopefully be a new Insider build. Oh, the last thing, Story Remix, by the way. Uh, it was announced earlier this week, maybe even over the weekend, potentially. That Story Remix, you know those features that build that everybody wanted, the actual, like... Uh, where you can edit the video and add like fireballs and flames and Michael Bay, the whole situation. Those features are actually supposed to be coming very soon, potentially in the next build for uh, Skip Ahead, 
which means they're not coming in Redstone 3, Redstone 4, even though they promised them for Redstone 3, but they'll show up in Redstone 4 with Story Remix, I think it's coming very soon. And so the, the corporate vice president of that Chris something Prattley, I think it is, announced this, hey, that is coming. And so uh, I'll be curious to see if that arrives next week. But I'll be curious, I don't know, we got an Apple event next week, new iPhones, that kind of stuff. It's on the 12th, which is what, I think Tuesday, I hope? Yeah, it's on Tuesday. And so, yeah, we'll see what Apple has up its sleeve for that. We'll see what Microsoft has up its sleeve. We're coming up to Ignite, which is, again, a very much a corporate thing. And so, there we go, guys. As always, thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you next week on The Sam's Report.